It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Uh, Looks like we've capped out. We've hit the debt limit, uh, according to the Treasury Department. And now we're going to start using some, uh, a series of accounting maneuvers to make sure that the federal government continues to pay its bills. And, and, you know, does it collapse the entire global financial market? You know, just a little thing like that. You know, we've hit the limit, and Republicans, well, they've seen a, they've seen an opportunity. They are giddy, our GO, GOP friends, giddy with delight over the prospect of checking another box off of their harming workers' wet dream list, going after Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, yeah, you you knew it was coming. Look, not surprising. This has been their Oh, this has been their moment. Oh boy. This has been this has been their fantasy. This is what they dream of. This is what, what keeps them up in the middle of the night, dreaming and fantasizing about. Basically, you know, getting granny back on the cat food. Uh now you had this 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 messaging machine. Uh, Republican Rick Allen from Georgia. Uh he just recently said that, you know, cutting social security was a good idea. Because, you know, people want to work longer. Huh? You want to work longer. Absolutely. So, yeah, cut that Social Security. Yeah, you know. And look, there may be some people out there that do want to work longer, that do want to continue, and we should make that possible. But we we don't go, yeah, because some one guy wants to work longer, you're going to have to work until you die. I'm sorry, Rick, not buying that. Uh, you had Republican Representative Michael Waltz from Florida um, on national television say that um, – if we really want to talk about the debt and spending, it's the entitlements. It's the entitlement programs. You know, Social Security and Medicare. This is where they're going. The Republican Study Committee. The big group of the GOP, the GOP Dra- Brain Trust. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't, I can't say that without laughing. Uh, they, they've got their 2023 budget calling for massive cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Increasing the Medicare age to 67, increasing Social Security to 70. And when the speaker, you know, the guy who sold his soul, uh, was asked point blank what his intention was on entitlement reform. Is that part of the negotiations, Mr. Speaker? Um, He said, well, he wouldn't predetermine anything. And what that really means is, "Mm, yeah, duh. We've only been telling you for a couple of decades now that we want to destroy this. Duh. Breaking news over at the F Channel. Breaking news. Headline. Retiring early could actually harm your health, according to a new study. Breaking news. Now you got House Republicans, you got the the GOP Brain Trust, the the study committee saying, no, no, we want people working longer. And the the, the media mouthpiece saying, no, no, it'll harm your, it's going to harm your health if you retire. You should work till you die because it's going to be good for your brain. Keep working. Because if you retire early, harmful, bad, bad. So keep working. Now this according to the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization. And their argument is is not wrong. It's not wrong that if you retire and you do nothing, you're probably going to have some some problems. I think of retirement as going to do something that you want to do. You worked all those years. You saved for the, the golden period of your life. Now you go and enjoy things. You sit with the grandkids, volunteer, do something. But no, they're going to spin this as, no, no, we can't let people retire because, you know, they'll just, they'll do nothing. And we need them to get to work. Now, what's interesting is you take the the Republican wet dream of destroying Social Security and the safety net for our seniors that's pulled uh, seniors out of poverty. 
the best anti-poverty program that we've ever passed, I believe. You've married it with the F channel and the media moguls here in this country saying, hey, you know, it's bad for you if you retire. And then we, we got this little thing in Davos going on where they're saying that we need to disrupt, disrupt our approach to retirement savings because, you know, people are living longer. And, you know, we, we have mandatory retirement ages and so we should scrap that, let people work you know, forever. And it's, it, seems, it seems interesting to me how all of the, the forces of the wealth class are aligning. You've got the Republican politicians. You've got the American media. You've even got this, uh, you know, this little economic forum that they throw on every year to tell us how we're going to solve our problems without actually solving any of the problems or having a plan to do that. You know, like funding things. Oh, no, I can't pay for that? No, no. While we're speaking about Davos, I see Joe Manchin. And you know we can't have one of these stories without Joe Manchin. Uh, you remember the other day we talked about him and Kirsten Cinema high-fiving over the idea on the, on the foreign stage that we're not going to do anything on the filibuster reform because we're not going to, no, we're not going to raise your taxes, rich people. Rest assured, we got your back. Here's the thing. It's easy to wheel and deal with other people's lives. And, and i got to ask you, hey, working people, hey, working folk like me, do you find it interesting that the first thing that comes to mind for Republicans when talking about, you know, cutting, cutting spending is taking it from you when we talk about debt when we talk about deficits it's taking it from you and your family does, does it does it make it does it make you kind of think because here's the thing joe manchin and and mittens mitt romney they've got a new plan <laughs> yes because republicans have said you know we might be willing to do something on the debt ceiling we might not allow the global you know economy to collapse if you just give us the pound of flesh which is retirement security for seniors uh, let us cut the program. Let us cut it. Let us cut it. Well, you've got Romney and uh, and 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 Manchin, which you know, what I think working class, I think two you know multimillionaires like Romney and 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 Manchin, they have introduced the Trust Act. Man, so good at naming. It's a Trust Act. There's trust. You know, the only thing I trust when Mitt Romney and and Joe Manchin come together is. I'm going to get the short end of the stick, that working people are screwed. Uh, but this trust act, their trust act, is going to establish a bipartisan rescue committee because we're going to rescue Social Security. This is the ultimate, we have to kill it to save it speak. This is the ultimate, we have to destroy it and tear it down to nothing so that we can we can rebuild it into, well, what we want it to be instead of what, what working people need it to be. Uh, what this trust act is going to do, you're going to have this rescue committee, understand, Social Security doesn't need to be rescued. And it doesn't add to the debt. Legally, cannot add to long-term debt. Can't. Doesn't. In fact, what, what's happened over the years, we've stolen from Social Security. You know, Go back to the Johnson years. Go back to the Reagan years. We've stolen trillions from Social Security. And now working people, again, are going to have to take it on the chin because, well, we don't want to raise taxes on rich people. That's what this boils down to. Understand that. So you think about it, you know, what what rabbit does does Manchin pull out of his hat? Cut Social Security. Cut Medicare. Make your access to it further down the road. Under the guise of we're just going to work together. We're going to work together on solutions because we've got a debt problem. Again, we don't we don't have a debt problem with Social Security. We got a funding problem. Put more money into it. You know how we solve make Social Security solvent right now immediately? Scrap the cap. Why is it that working people pay Social Security tax on every dime they make, and yet our gazillionaires, not so much? Maybe enact a wealth tax, since most rich people don't earn wages. There's an idea. Oh, we can't have that conversation. That would be much like solving a real problem. Now, I look at this trust act, which is nothing more than a rehashed Simpsons Bowles Commission. If you remember the Simpson Bowles Commission during the, the Obama years, which was an abomination back then. Again, 
the idea being we need to push it off. We need to make it harder to get. We need to put more obstacles in the way so that, you know, because, you know, you working people, are just, you're just going to waste it. You're going to just, just fret it away. Now, what I find interesting is, is Manchin's providing cover for the Republicans here. He's, he's the go-between between between the MAGA extremists who run the Republican Party and the Biden administration because he thinks that Biden's going to cave. Oh, yeah, we're going to find a bipartisan solution to, to screw over for future future workers. They're not going to do it to people retired today. So, Granny, rest assured, you're okay. Your grandchildren, screwed. Your children, probably screwed. But definitely the grandkids. And yeah, no big deal. So long as we've got our gas stove that we can hold on to. But understand, our mega friends and, and mega people, understand, this means you. This is your Social Security, too. This is your safety net. This is, this is your retirement they're fooling with. They are going to hold the, the debt ceiling as a hostage tool to get the pound of flesh, your retirement security, to be put into, well, there's more talk of privatization again. This is another manufactured crisis. This is another in the GOP playbook to get their pound of flesh. And of course, as I say all the time, Republicans hate working people. Again, look at another policy. Make no mistake about this. This Republican Party is going to use this debt crisis to harm working people. And that's the point. The cruelty, I, I keep coming back to this, the cruelty is the point. So my question, my question to the audience, my question to you is, what are you going to do about it? What, what's the plan? How are you going to stand up? You made the mistake of putting these, 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 these economic terrorists in Congress. What are you going to do about it? I look at France right now. Oh, you're not going to bring up France. Yeah, they're working people get it in france they're talking about raising the retirement age to 64 from 62 to 64 think of, think of this this think of this they're talking about there there's there's an idea there's a plan they're striking in the streets the trains have stopped electricity supplies have stopped the streets are jammed they're saying no the people are speaking here We've got the F channel. We've got the F channel. You know, if you retire early, it could be bad for your health. You need two or three jobs. It's working, you know, two, three jobs. It's good for you. Uniquely American, as George Bush once said. And I keep coming back to it. How many times do we have to play this, this, this reel? Because we've seen this movie over and over again. This has always been their, their fantasy. This is their fetish. And it is about the power and it's about the money, but it's also about the cruelty. Because what we know is if you destroy Social Security, if you take this away from seniors, we're going to go back to what we had in the past. Massive poverty in old age. People dying in horrible conditions. And that, I got to think, just makes them giddy with, with glee. Love to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com or give us your thoughts, 1-866-416-RICK, 1-866-416-7425. Going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around and listen to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania to the auto factories of Michigan to the modern makers room, Manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work 
for America. So uh, union membership has dropped from 10.3 to 10.1 percent, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's the lowest that it's been in, well, many decades. I mean, we're almost to the point in the private sector where uh, the density is where it was, where it was illegal to be a union member. And they could fire you, if, you know, at, at will because of you, know, you signed a yellow dog contract. Now, we're at a moment where, you know, union approval ratings higher than they've they've been at any point in my lifetime. Uh, 71 percent of Americans approve of labor unions. But interestingly enough, 58 percent of the non-union workers say they're not interested in joining unions. And a huge part of this, I believe. I believe it has to do with the fact that that workers keep getting harassed, intimidated, beaten up and all of the things that come along with uh, with 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 attempting to join and form unions. And I look at at this this story coming out of Florida where the NLRB, the, the regional director there, has said that the election at Starbucks in Florida was so badly tainted, uh, was so, so egregious in the number of violations that when the vote, workers voted and, and voted against the union 21 to 11, that there's no way to go back and rerun that election and make it fair. And what they're talking about doing is imposing, imposing a mandate to bargain. And this is what I said back when uh, Amazon you know, beat up their workers in, in Bessemer, Alabama. With all of the, the the plethora of egregious violations, I said the NLRB should come in and say, you know what, you've done so many things, tainted the pool so badly, harassed these people so much that you should have to engage in bargaining. And I was told, no, no, they can't do that. They have the power to do this. And I'm glad they're seeing to see them doing this now. We'll see what happens. We'll see how it plays out. But you know, this could be just the small test case. I mean, at a huge facility like Amazon, that's that, that's a big lift. But this is, I'm telling you, this is, is something that has to happen. We need major comprehensive labor law reform to ensure that workers who want to form unions and want to join unions can join unions. This is, this is one of those, this is one of those moments that I'm just, you know, we just need it. Uh, it, it really is. Uh, when the numbers are that are that stark, uh, it tells you something something needs to be done. Uh, let's go to the phones. We got Bob from San Jose on line one. Bob, how are you doing today? Pretty good, although I can I can barely hear you. Because, uh, I, I'm a broadcast engineer. I can tell you that the the uh, transmit level coming back on the uh, on your hybrid is not high enough. I can I can hear you, but not very well. Well, then you should come over and help me fix that, because we've been working I on would. it. I would. I <laughs> would. I'm in Silicon Valley, which I'm sure is quite far from you. By the way, it's spelled S-I-L-L-Y hyphen C-O-N. <laughs> Silicon. And lots of Silicons have happened out here. Uh, no, what I, what I was calling about is is there is a, a I guess you could say, Puritan a puritanical school of thought that goes back hundreds of years. I, I call it a Christian heresy. And, and, and what it is is they, they assume you are, in effect, a sinner by, by birth and whatever, and, and, and along through your life, if you don't have wealth, it's because you made mistakes, you made bad decisions, and God did not bless you. So if you have wealth, God did bless you. That's the proof that you are a good person. But if you don't have wealth, then you then you are a bad person, and you deserve your consequences. And and um, th- this is a, a let's say I call it a Christian heresy because it, because I have heard this is in a uh, in some churches, and the Puritans were one of them, have this as as their core belief. Yeah, it's the prosperity gospel, people. You know, you're absolutely right. Well, prosperity gospel is is a piece of it on the other side, if you will. Uh, but this is this is the one that that if 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 you're poor, it's because you made bad bad decisions and you need to suffer your consequences. No, I agree. No, what's interesting though is they follow the guy who said, you know, help the poor, feed the sick, heal the the, uh, the sick, feed the the hungry, clothe the naked. I, you know, at least that's oh, what the yeah. book says. Oh no, that that's where I'm coming from. But but there's these people who who point fingers and say, 
well, you made ob- obviously you did something bad. You made bad decisions. Therefore, you get your consequences. Gee, sorry. No, I agree with you. You were born into the wrong family. You should have been born <laughs> well, rich that, like you us. You could say that you made it, you made a bad choice of of who your parents were. <laughs> No, it's it's sad, and the reality is it comes out in our policies, doesn't it? Well, it, it it's you know I I tend to to look at things as as I tend to think of life as being like we're in a lifeboat, and we're sharing this lifeboat together. We can either fight with each other and point fingers at each other and go around in circles, or we can cooperate with each other and help each other. In which case, we might make it to shore together. It's a good way of thinking of things. I wish more people thought that way. Yeah, well, see, I, 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 I'm blanking on where it is. It's somewhere in the Bible. The Calvinism, by the way, is the name of that that sec, that thing I was talking about. Uh, it took me a while to c- come uh, come back to that because it's such, I find it such a detestable thought. No, I'm, anyway, I'm with you. I do want to thank you for being on WCPT, which is the station I listen to, even though I'm in San Jose, no, through the Internet. It's, it's amazing, and we love our folks there in Chicago uh, and all of our radio affiliates, uh, and I appreciate you tuning in. Thanks, Bob. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Bye. I'd love to hear you, hear you call back again. No, I mean, he's, he's not wrong. Look, these religious elitists uh, who look down, and this is the reason that I'm— I've taken a I've taken a beating over the years for this for saying that I don't think churches should be the place where we help the poor and the sick. This is where policy, you know, government policy, us using our government as a tool to do the things collectively that we can't individually do. Helping helping the sick, helping the the poor, uh, you know, making sure that no child goes to bed hungry, which good on Joe Biden here in the next couple of years they're moving towards uh, ending childhood hunger. Should have done that 50 years ago. But this this idea that though the churches will will be benevolent and dole this stuff out, I wish that were true. It's not, and I've lived that experience of having the church folks look down their nose at you while they're giving you half measures, because they do have this belief that they're better, that their wealth, that their economic power makes them superior, not just in in public spaces, but in the eyes of of the, the heavenly spirits, and that's dangerous. Because when they are allowed to, to move those ideas into policymaking, again, it comes back to the cruelty, the suffering that you deserve, you're going to get. So we're going to take Social Security. We're going to take Medicare. We're going to take food stamps. We're going to take heating assistance because you don't deserve this. Because, you know, just like Bob said, you know, you did something wrong. You're being punished and you deserve this. These, This is the thinking of these folks. And it's scary because, well... They don't care about you. They don't care about me. They don't care about this country. They care about themselves and their narrow ideology. And that's what's frightening to me. Uh, because we've, we've kind of, as a society, I think moved a little bit in that, not totally, but a little bit in that direction to where it's okay to, to, to kick the, those who are down instead of reaching that helping hand uh, out and helping someone up. We can get back to it. We can come together. At least that's my hope. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. you listen to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. I took two years of electric in high school, and I was the only girl in the class there here. I'm the only girl as far as installers go. I'm a single mom, too. I joined the union because it gave me options for health care and life insurance so that I know my son's taken care of. I like what I do. Like, this is the best job I've ever had. You think solar panels is more like California. You wouldn't think Appalachia would have any. It would be smart if the government would invest more in clean energy resources. It doesn't matter what kind of weather doesn't matter what time of day or night. When Mother Nature's done her worst, the only thing that matters to us is keeping the lights on for you. The hardworking women and men of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, dedicated to keeping the power on in communities all across the country. Because when bad weather strikes, we know what matters most. IBEW, the power professionals. Yeah. 
I've been taking a lot of a lot of guff here the last couple of days because I've said, look, you know, these failed states in the South that don't help their citizens, don't protect their citizens, don't lead uh, to look. Places like Arkansas, like Georgia, like Alabama, like Mississippi, lower life expectancy rates, higher infant mortality rates, higher poverty rates. All of the negatives are higher. All of the positives are lower. Does it mean that I have a problem with the people of, of Alabama or Arkansas? No, I've, I've met them. They're beautiful people. I want the best for them. It's their policymakers. It's the ideology that's being rammed down people's throats. That's what I have a problem with. Practice your religion. Do your thing. But don't push it on other people. You know, I go back to that. I, I was thinking about a, a an acquaintance I had years ago. And and I, I can remember it like it was yesterday because it was so such a foreign idea that I was just like, wow, so you, you literally reach into a box of snakes. Uh, as part of their religion, they, reach, they would reach into a box of snakes and, and pick up and handle the snakes because in the Bible it says something about handling snakes. And I said, well, what happens if you get bitten? You know, oh, well, we've got the anti-venom in the back. And this, this comes back to that mental gymnastics that a lot of my Republican friends have. I said, well, hold on. If the test is you reach into the box and it's God's will that the snake bites you and you die, aren't you usurping God's will? No, 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 no. The mental gymnastics come. You know, if God didn't want us to have the antivenom, he wouldn't have allowed us to create it. And I'm going, okay, well, what's the point then? If, 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 if you're supposed to you know, reach into the box, God's will is you get bitten and you die— uh, but you have the ability to to not die. What's the, what's the exercise for? He said it's it's to make us lead better lives. And I'm going at a certain level. Okay, how many times have you been bitten? Like seven or eight. Really? <laughs> and and the more I I learned about this guy, the more he would do just the most outrageous, you know, unethical, unfaithful kind of things. I'm not going to go into it because he's probably listening. But the justification was there. And and they've used this kind of stuff to, well, to justify just about anything. And taking food out of the mouth, mouths of children and granny, that doesn't, doesn't phase them. On the aggregate, I mean, when you talk to individual people, I love individuals, groups not so much. And I think this is what's going on with the Republican Party, that once you say, hey, there's something wrong with your party platform, there's something wrong with the direction your party's taking this country. It's an attack on the individual. I'm not attacking the individual. You know, when someone says the Democrats are screwed up and they do something stupid, I look at it and go, yeah, they, they are. Uh, policy wise, they may not agree with it. But we're we're in a weird place in this country right now where we can't have those discussions. The stove thing to me is is amazing. Because I do have that vision in my head of someone like Matt Gates wearing an asbestos coat going, you're not going to take my asbestos coat. I want to hear your thoughts. 1-866-416-RICK. 1-866-416-7425. Are you concerned that, that Social Security is on the cutting block? Calling all builders. All welders and roofers, engineers and electricians, calling all brick masons and boilermakers, steel workers and steam fitters. Your country is calling you to rebuild America, to create a cleaner, safer, more prosperous future for all. Tackling climate change, this is the job of our lifetime. It's time to build back better. Let's get to work. I've lived an honest life. I've never been uh, uh, accused, sued of, of any m bad doings. George Santos's campaign last year was a campaign of deceit, lies, 
fabrication. George Santos said he attended the elite Horace Mann School, but poor thing had to drop out before he could graduate because he said his parents couldn't afford the fees. Turns out that was false. The school told CNN there's no record he ever went there. And Santos is already under investigation by the district attorney in Long Island. He said he had degrees from Baruch College and from NYU, but now admits he's never graduated from any university. Mr. Santos is wanted by Brazilian authorities. He claimed he lost four employees in the Pulse nightclub attack. The New York Times found no proof of that. Told me I remember specifically that he was a star on the Baruch volleyball team and that they won the league championship. He said he was Jewish, called himself a proud American Jew, but now says he's Catholic and only meant to say he was Jewish, whatever that means. He's the Anna Delvey of politics. Santos said 9-11 claimed my mother's life, but soon after he said that his mother died in 2016. I'll take a job yep. that pays me for no experience. Will you step down? down for I will not. If there is something that rises to the occasion that he did something wrong, then we'll deal with that at that time. Tell us why it's important for you to burn a cigar occasionally in your office. Well, thank you for having me, Tucker. It's all about freedom. The Fox News is about as fair and as balanced as you can get. You, you, you present both sides. Keep focusing yeah. on giving people their own color M&Ms uh, <laughs> while we, you know, take over all of the mineral deposits in the entire world. I just don't know how to say it to my superiors that their surrogate fondled my junk without my consent. Little thing that, you know, that comes out of the vagina like this it's about this big they say it looks like a jelly bean they're emptying out their mental institutions let me into the united states joe biden arguably has done something far worse than anything donald trump was ever accused of doing hitler was a pedophile and kind of a pagan it's like well he was also really f cool you're not taking our gas stoves away from us that is your choice and i know many people who cook a lot do not want to part with their gas stoves and so we're going to stand up for that welcome back to the rick smith show now here is rick smith so on wednesday you had treasury secretary janet yellen visiting with the chinese vice premier over there in the the uh in De davos there uh, and look, this is another one of those points of contact between the Biden administration and the Chinese going, hey, we're not going to undo all the stuff that everyone thought we were going to do and undo the tariffs and go back to business as usual. And thank goodness it's about time we wake up. And I don't know how much of this is you know, coming out of the pandemic uh, that we realize our supply chains are horribly broken and we're way too dependent on communist China. Or if it's just us going, hey, wait a second. Um, we, we want the jobs back. We, we, we should have domestic production for domestic consumption heading in the right direction. At least I think so. And here to share some thoughts on, well, are we and is the administration doing what we need to do and are they doing it fast enough? That's why I've asked Emily De La Brea to come talk with us. She's the co-founder of Horizon Advisory. Horizonadvisory.org is their website. They've also got a new piece out on, on Dell bringing production back and also asking the question, is that enough? Emily, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you for having me. So let's start with uh, what's going on over there in, in Switzerland uh, with Yellen and the vice vice uh, premier there. Uh, another point of contact, another moment for the Biden administration uh, to stand up for American workers. A am I reading this right or is, th or is there something else here? I mean, Obviously, I always have to see the glass half empty because that's why you have me on. Um, there's a part of this that I actually find very frustrating because on the one hand, you know, yes, the Biden administration's rhetoric has correctly been one of competition with China, but much of the reason, or at least how they're framing their recent interactions with um, the Chinese government, including Yellen's visit with Liu He, much of that they've said is like, around making sure that competition stays below a simmer, um, managing the competition to make sure it doesn't turn into conflict. And I mean, that's a frustrating thing, at least for me to see, because this is a conflict. China sees it as a conflict. And saying that the US is trying to manage it to keep competition limited to certain domains or below a certain threshold means that China doesn't take us seriously because they know that we're constantly going to try to find a compromise and that we're going to try to de-escalate the second anything gets too extreme. Um, and that gives them something to play with. But could you look at this and go, look, we're, we're losing. We, you know, we've lost this battle already. We've given away our manufacturing base. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, I think most of us realized our supply chains are way too broken and we're way too dependent. Uh, and do you, maybe I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt here of going, look, we're in a weak position at this moment. 
Um, and this is a negotiating tactic as we try and reclaim some of my manufacturing, or am I just justified? Maybe you're the pessimist, not me. This is great. Um, we're still the world, we're still the global leader, right? Like, yes, our manufacturing is absolutely you know, devastated by where it was in some very, very critical sectors. We've lost you know, all our capacity really across the board. We've lost most of much of our capacity. We've lost um, you know, the kind of support, we you know, skills, um, the infrastructure we need for manufacturing, but we are still the dominant global power. And that gives us, I think, more leverage than you know saying that we're losing gives us credit for we do control the global system china is very dependent on us in key domains we have strong allies whom we can and should be pushing we have a strong private sector china can't function without us right now the point is but we're not competing in a way that actually pushes on their weaknesses no no and i agree but my problem is I, I, coming out of this pandemic and the pandemic i think is magnified what we've been talking about on this show for years is that by by giving away your manufacturing ability take chips for instance uh, there are so many things we can't make without these magic chips. Why we allowed production to go overseas is beyond me. Why we allowed uh, that that vital component, especially on the military front, to be made in China is well beyond my my realm of understanding. Other than we had some CEOs who go, hey, this means more money for me, more power for the corporate interest. Screw those workers. Screw the consumers. Screw the country. We care about profit. I get that. But I don't know as a country why we allowed it. Because we're short termist, because we didn't look in the long term, because we love convincing ourselves that, you know, the myth of globalization is right and everyone actually is out there for mutual interest um, because we bought China's propaganda. Um, I don't, did, did we buy it or did they did did corporate America sell it to us uh, in, in prepackaged little Madison Avenue kind of talking points? Because I never bought the whole thing of, hey, let's go get cheap products from somewhere else and bring them back here and we won't make it here. And it's going to be great. We're all going to have corner offices and wear white tie, white shirts and ties and be able to buy all the cheap plastic crap we can get from China. And it's going to be utopia that never lasts. I don't even know that it ever happened. I mean, I take it back. Washington bought the Chinese propaganda and the propaganda that was redisseminated by corporate America. But yeah, I think that's key. And I mean, that's like when you talk about prop Chinese propaganda in general, it's not just Beijing spouting it. It's Beijing using its mouthpieces across the U.S. to spout it, which is what makes it that much more dangerous. Now, you guys have a new a new piece out over at uh, the Force Distance Times. Uh, ForceDistanceTimes.com, the website, the story why Dell ditch, ditching... Uh, Chinese chips is great, but not enough. And you, in this pre the, the part that caught my attention is you point out that as of 2021, 85% of Dell's supply chain is in China. And when I told my kids that, I go, they go, well, wait a second. I thought Dell was an American company. I thought, I thought, dude, you got a Dell. I thought that was, that was here. And, and it's not. I mean, that's great. So in Chinese media, if you look at Chinese media talking about Dell, they describe it as a foreign owned domestic company a foreign owned local company like dell is so embedded in terms of production in terms of joint ventures research, research and development in china that it's actually described in chinese sources as effectively a chinese company wow now they are bringing some as i understand from your story they're bringing some chip production somewhere else maybe not here uh, per se but they're move they're moving a little bit out of china and you think this is um, potentially a good, a good, a good thing, or uh, I think, as you put it, uh, uh, or putting a bandaid over a bullet hole. So they announced last week, right, that they're going to try to move away from Chinese-made semiconductors, and that they're also going to encourage their suppliers to decrease dependence on Chinese products. Which is, I mean, that's great, right? Like any announcement like that on the part of a U.S. company, especially a big U.S. company, is a huge step, and it signals a change to this decades-long offshoring dependence to and on China. Um, but it's not like this is just a semiconductor's problem. It's not like Dell can just make this announcement and fix its broader exposure problem with China. So if this is like the first in many announcements, that's great. If this is the first in Dell shutting down its research and development centers in China, that's fantastic. Um, if Dell's also moving its Chinese suppliers to non-Chinese suppliers, all of those that would be the turnaround we need. But the risk is that you know, 
Dell, the U.S. corporate sector, the U.S. government, what have you, have minimized the China problem to one about semiconductors or about very, very specific nodes that are buzzy and have press attention and therefore missed the reality that this is a much, much larger industrial problem across every sector, every node and every value chain um, across the board. Now, help me here because, you know, I've been I've been encouraged by what the administration has been doing on the chips bill and, and, and some of this stuff of reclaiming manufacturing and, and bringing it back. Not thrilled that we have to pay for it, but eventually we have to get it back one way or another uh, because we do need to have the ability to produce domestically, uh, if not just because it's going to create the jobs and the economy we need. But, you know, from a national security standpoint, if you can't produce anything, you're kind of screwed in, in a world if you're going to be a military power. Uh, I look at the administration as as moving us in a direction to get away from the same horrible neoliberalism that that caused this this kind of uh, situation. The bad trade deals, the bad uh, the corporate pipeline that ships jobs overseas that we have to fund. Do you hold my optimism that maybe this is the beginning of a of a, of a, of a change globally, or is this just an opportunity for the moment? Because uh, I'm hoping that this is the change I've been I've been screaming about for decades now. Um, first of all, you need to manufacture not only for national security, but also economic security. Like, how are you supposed to have growth, have opportunity, have a country that builds if we can't make anything? Um, but to the actual question, I'm of two minds. So this has been a watershed past few years. And like, that's undeniable, right? There's new production coming to America. There's a new rhetoric about nearshoring and reshoring and companies are, and investors are taking it seriously. That said, and it's really like the Dell story magnified, this is not enough. The CHIPS Act is not enough. That approach to industrial policy or to reinvesting in American production is not enough because are we really gonna take the CHIPS bill, all tens of billions of dollars of it, and do that across every value chain that matters and every node in every value chain that matters? Um, that's not what the US does. Like that's not how we operate and think how much we would have to pay for that. Like there has to be a broader approach one that realizes that there are things beyond semiconductors that matter but also it's not going to be the government directing everything um, and part of i think what that means is imposing real costs on china for distorting markets it's not just subsidizing to bring you know U u.s subsidies up to match chinese subsidies it's also punishing china for their non-free market approach um, because if we just keep building subsidies after subsidies china is going to win that contest um, that's like competing against Beijing's greatest strength, which right. is not going to be good. For no, us because we, think. our political system doesn't allow for that. I mean, just to get the, the meager investment that we've gotten in infrastructure and this chips bill, which both historic, uh, but not, not big, not chunky, not bold, not visionary. Like I would have liked to have seen. In fact, the infrastructure bill was a $1.2 trillion. And you've got the American society of civil engineers saying we need 4.8 trillion. Um, I mean, these half measures only get us so far as where, as you're pointing out, that you know China can just do this because they're a communist government. Exactly. And we're not actually holding them accountable for breaking the rules of the global system. But here again, you, you wrote in, in this piece that I, I found interesting of, of how ingrained these American companies are in the Chinese communist government and how, you know Dell with the, the surveillance state and and developing software and all kinds of things that that have really bore them in. And, and, I, and I would argue harmed not just us, but the globe. How do you untie that then? How, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure out how they they're able to back away from that because they are so dependent and ingrained in there. Yeah. And because of that, like, that's one of the big reasons that the U.S. hasn't imposed the costs on China and on China exposure that we should have, because every time there's really hard hitting legislation on that front, the U.S. private sector comes in and says, oh, no, we can't do that. It'll destroy our business models. Um, we won't be able to operate. And yeah, but shouldn't it? This is where out of it. this is where I go. Shouldn't it? Should this not destroy them? Should this not be the moment where you go, hey, you made your bed lay in it. You're the one who made these unholy alliances. You're the one for pure greed who sold this country out and ran over there for for slave labor and, and lax environmental regulations and more profit in your pocket while screwing over the workers in this country. Should, you deserve what you get. Should we do that? And market works. Markets work. So if companies are forced to figure out another way, either they will or a new competitor will come in and do this a way that actually helps America. Um, so, 
you know, that's like the U.S. The government needs to step up. American people need to step up and actually hold companies accountable. And this is where um, I was going to go. It goes back to the point about like actually punishing China for breaking the rules. That's only one part of it. The other part is punishing U.S. companies for undermining U.S. strength. So there should be much, much stronger costs imposed on American companies for selling us out to China and for continuing to do so. And this is where consumers have to play into this. This is where, you know, I'm thrilled with the administration's Buy American policies. I'm thrilled with the idea that the EVs and the new technology that they're going has has uh, inv- you know in- incentives if they're made here. I think we need to do that. I know Europe's losing their mind over the, the incentives uh, on, on, on the EVs and new technology. But you know what? At some point, you got to begin rebuilding your own house. That Europe thing also, um, okay, my whole objective for this was to get the quote yelling about yelling in here. So <laughs> I don't want to be yelling about yelling, but um, I think the Europe thing is also important, Rice, her meeting, um, her China meeting, like China's, re- or Europe is really mad about the U.S. only focusing on China. Um, and with reason, like Europe is our ally. And yes, the U.S. should be pushing Europe, Um but like now is the chance to do so rather than signaling to them at Davos that all we care about is China and all we care is our kind of like flip flopping approach to China. Um, and just, you know, following those proceedings from a distance, I have like been frustrated by the U.S. like not actually sitting down with our partners and being like, here's what we're doing. Here's why it matters. Let's try to get on the same page about this. Um, and like if we're going to prioritize China, which, yes, we should in a competitive way, we should be prioritizing China in a way that's aligned with Europe. No, because, you know, I, you know I've, I've been watching a lot of the content coming out, um, you know, out of Davos and, and a lot of the, the, the commentary is that, you know, basically Europe is the battleground in this war between the U.S. and China. And and we do need to, to bring our allies in. We do need to have a, a joint strategy. And look, I say this about Trump all the time. I give him credit uh, for the blind squirrel finding the nut. China is a problem, has always been a problem, something I've been screaming about Uh but, you know, didn't do anything. I mean, the tariffs were, you know, a half measure, but didn't have a strategy, didn't have a plan to, to pull the rest of the world in. And I'm hoping that the Biden administration does, because uh, are you so let's start here. Are you surprised that the administration didn't undo the tariffs, uh, the, the Trump tariffs? No, I'm not surprised. I mean, at this point, the political this and this is great, right? Like, this is the most positive I see. The political pressure is such that you cannot do that bipartisan issue every you know an american public issue the american public is pressuring the u.s government to be tough on china and it now comes at a real political cost for either party not to um so no i'm not surprised and i think that that pressure is going to stay which is great no, it's what we need. If we're going to rebuild our manufacturing prowess, if we're going to bring jobs back, if we're going to heal our supply chains and deal with our inflation problems, it starts with being able to produce your own stuff. Because, uh, again, you know, this is you know part of it. The inflation is due to our, our broken supply chains. Also, good old American, good old fashioned American greed. Uh, that's a big part of it, but also our broken supply chain. And if, if nothing, if nothing we learn coming out of the pandemic, uh, that that should be the lesson make stuff at home. Yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, that was the real danger to my mind with all the talk about pulling back tariffs to respond to inflation was that was that would have fixed the wrong problem. That would fix the wrong problem because that would just perpetuate the broken supply chains that are themselves, the, you know, the underlying issue. So last line of question, last question I've got for you, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little more hopeful now than I've been in a very long time. Uh, I see the administration doing some things I'm happy with. Uh, are, are you hopeful that we're, we're heading in the right direction? I, I know a lot more needs to be done. I know we need to be much bolder and, and we can argue tactics, but do you have do you have hope at least we're moving in the right direction? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think it's, you know, I have hope in that the political incentive is there, um, but also like it seems like the market incentive is there. Like it's very clear that investors are moving toward companies that are operating on you know, and invest in American production logic. It's clear those companies are doing well, but also that the reverse is true, um, that investors are worried about China and companies are worried about having major China exposure. And the U.S. is the U.S., right? So like recognition and political pressure in Washington is one thing. What we need is the market also to be on board. And it seems like increasingly both those forces are aligned. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this and I, your article on Dell, you know, was, 
Uh, and now you could take that about the thousands of companies that have gone over there and how they've they've integrated their supply chains and, and become hyper dependent. Because as you pointed out, you know, three quarters of their productive capacities in is reliant on China. I don't know how you I don't know how you run, run a lemonade stand like that, being that dependent on someone who's that well at any minute can steal your technology. And if you get ripped off, you deserve it. I've always said that you went over there. You knew what you were getting into. You got ripped off. Well, that's your problem. Uh, there's a place where you could come where your intellectual property is is well protected right here. You should have stayed. Precisely. 100 percent. I know I rambled a bit, but this this is one of those issues that I'm hoping I'm hoping we, we finally come back to some bit of sanity. on. Uh, but I hope folks will take a look at the article. Why Dell ditching Chinese chips is great, but not enough. Uh, written by our good friend here, Emily De Liberia, co-founder of Horizon Advisory. We'll get links out over at forceddistancetimes.com, how you can get that. A lot of websites. We'll put it out on social media. Emily, great talking with you. I appreciate you taking time for us. Absolutely. It was great to see you. All right. You're going to take a quick break. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Right back after this. Stick around. <laughs> I've been driving buses for five years, and my day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads. But I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. Then the Teamsters pushed a lot so we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind, the, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, thericksmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. So, you know, I'm looking at at this this story that Emily De La Bria and the folks over at Horizon Advisory came out with uh, on Dell. And, and it, it's, it can be it can be any company that went over to China. Uh, they got they got they got lured in. Cheap labor. We can use slave labor. You can abuse your workers. No minimum wage. No maximum hour laws. None of that. None of that American stuff. Uh, and when the workers, you know, have had enough and they want to commit suicide, you just put put nets in the stairwells so so nobody can do it, and then put them back to work. So they got they got they got really cheap labor. They got you no know, no environmental regulation. They got whatever they wanted. Massive subsidies from the Chinese government, and they got they got they got sucked in. And as they point out, 85% of Dell's supply chain was in, in China in 2021. 75% of its productive capacity in China, heavily reliant. So when the communist Chinese government says, jump, you better know how high. They put their research and development plants there. They've, they've worked on, on surveillance. They've worked on you know, all kinds of things that I would argue not great for democracies. And basically stole their technology and, and, and are taking over their technology. And you go, well, well why would they do that? Well, it, it's, it's, it's the greed. It comes back to the, the greed of our, our, cap, our, our, our CEO class, the folks who sit in those, those, those ivory towers and think about how they can maximize their own wealth and that of the shareholders, because the shareholder, shareholders are sacked or sacked. we got to maximize shareholder wealth at all costs, even if it means, you know, using slave labor, even if it means screwing over a gener couple of generations of American workers, stealing their pensions, crushing wages, all that stuff. And I've been screaming about this for years because of all of the negatives that come out of it. But I know, I, but, but Rick, you know, we get, we get cheap stuff. No, we don't get cheap stuff. When you when you look at the the total costs, it's not cheap. And from the national security standpoint, and this is what the conversation I had with my kids today, you know, as we were talking about this, you know, 
We won World War II for two reasons. One, we had an energy supply, and two, we had massive manufacturing capacity that can be moved over to war production. Do we have that capacity currently? You know, we just did a tour uh, back in, in October and into November, the Working Class Heroes radio tour, where we went to a lot of places where we used to make a lot of stuff. Uh, those buildings are hollowed out. Those buildings are remnants of what they used to be. I know, we're not going to fight wars like we used to. Yeah, we're going to fight them with chips made in China. So the question is, is can we move faster? Look, I'm, I'm happy with the Biden administration moving us in this direction of undoing some of the, the negatives of the last 40 years. I just think we need to be moving a lot faster. And we'll see. All right, it's going to come down to you. It's going to come down to me. It's going to come down to us saying enough is enough and changing our, our thinking on what what we've been sold over the last 40 years. What the economics profession has jammed down our throat as as well. Absolute. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Rick If you miss any portion of the program, make sure you grab the podcast wherever you find yours. You'll find ours. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.